Anyway, I uh, just wanted to invite everyone, thank you everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar on Infinity Banking with Life Insurance. I'm your host, Kavita Baratake. I'm excited to have our guest speaker on today, who also actually happens to be my mentor uh, in the life insurance world. So I got my license last year and I started working on this because I was fascinated by Infinity Banking. Um, so Gary Pinkerton here is a real estate investor, a professional speaker. He's a wealth strategist and retired US Navy captain. So he's actually got an engineering degree in nuclear engineering. So it's, a, it's a, quite a transition there, Gary. <laughs> from nuclear engineering to uh, life insurance. So he's been helping people learn about what he calls the perpetual wealth strategy and wealth maximization accounts that can help them build a strong foundation focused on safety and security and pursuing a dependable, consistent growth of the assets. Today, Gary is here to talk to us about these wealth maximization accounts, also commonly known as the infinite banking concept and how it can help us. So a little disclaimer before we get into uh, the education uh, and the slides. Uh, this is for educational purposes only, as always, for tax-related questions or anything specific to your situation. We also always recommend consulting your own attorney, financial advisor, or CPA, as it might be appropriate. A few housekeeping rules. Everyone is on mute automatically. And if you have any issues with the audio or visual at any point, please type it in the chat box and let me know ASAP so we can fix it. I also record this. So I wanna make sure there are no issues in the recording as well, because a lot of people sign up and then watch the recording later. Also, please ask your questions in the Q&A box. So please locate that Q&A box at the top or bottom, uh, depending on whether you have a Zoom application or you have a browser. Uh, please ask those questions there and not in the chat box because it just becomes really hard to track. The chat box is just scrolling. Uh, I will record this webinar and the link will be sent out to all attendees within 24 hours. And please whitelist my email so it can go to the right folder. A quick note about some upcoming webinars we have. Uh, next week, we have a webinar on tax and asset protection strategies with Toby Mathis from Anderson Legal Business and Tax Advisors. And the registration link is right there. Uh, just use, usually use the short link so it's easy to remember and register. Also for future webinars, we have quite a few lined up and we're gonna go at a little bit lower pace every two weeks because I've been doing every week and sometimes twice a week nowadays, which is a bit much for uh, me and maybe for you as well with webinar fatigue. So I just wanna pace it out a little better now. Um, since we're all home, I figured I'll just hammer you guys with webinars. <laughs> But uh, I'm going to slow down the pace a little bit, but I want to really bring all the important topics to you about how things are changing in the COVID uh, with COVID environment. So one of the things a lot of people asked for was multifamily lending options. How is that cl the climate around lending changing? So I'm getting a very large multifamily lender to come talk to us about this. Another important aspect of being in this season has been estate planning. A lot of people have, I mean, estate planner, attor planning attorneys are busier than ever right now because people have suddenly decided or realized that, oh my God, I don't have stuff in place. And I've always been taking this for granted, but I can't, right? Like suddenly this environment makes you realize that you cannot take everything for granted. So that's something that I want to um, kind of hammer in, like hammer on and bring to all my viewers. The other one is mindset makeover. So I have a very large coaching company who's helping me with this. So they're gonna come talk to us about how we can make over our mindsets and deal with the situation and make the, not just deal with the situation, but also turn all the problems we have into opportunities because there are a lot of opportunities which are gonna be coming up soon and which are there in the current market as well if you can see them and take advantage of them. Also wanted to let you guys know about our ongoing webinars. We do a lot of kids' financial education. So I do this every week. Uh, and I've been doing this for the past eight weeks for teens and tweens, 11 to 18 years old. Um, we have covered everything from assets and liabilities to um, uh, insurance, to taxes, to everything that they need to know as adults. And we have, we have everything recorded on YouTube. And so if your kids have missed it, they are, uh, welcome to check out the recordings. We've done uh, 
a smaller version with my partner, Anar Pitre. She's handling the kids, five to 10 years old, and she's doing a little simpler version of the topics that I'm covering for the older kids. Um, we are also, we, I, I still have four more sessions to go. So if you guys, if you have kids who, are, who might be interested, please check us out because all these um, are independent of each other. So they can join in at any time and still take advantage of it. So a little bit about me, a lot of you folks know me, but today I'm seeing a, quite a few new names, partly because I have been sending this webinar out on different forums. So I am a real estate investor. I've been one since 2009. I got into real estate full-time last year after quitting my job uh, from Atlassian. I've, I've been in technology industry for 19 plus years before this. I'm a realtor and also a life insurance agent. I work with busy professionals, investors, and business owners. I graduated with a master's degree in computer science in 2000, and I also have my own rental portfolio and I do multifamily investments. I'm passionate about investor education, so I run this group called Purely Passive Investor Group. If you haven't checked it out, uh, do look it up. And I do weekly and bi-weekly webinars. Um, I also have a YouTube channel where I post all the webinars and more content. So my goal is to educate more people on investing and financial education for kids and adults. Today, our guest speaker, I'm really excited to have Gary on. He is a real estate investor and uh, professional speaker, retired US Navy captain and belt strategist at Paradigm Life. Gary earned his BS degree in mechanical engineering from US Naval Academy and a master of science in nuclear engineering from University of Illinois. He spent 26 years as a submarine officer in US Navy commanding the nuclear attack submarine USS Tucson and retiring as a captain. In 2011, Gary actually got into the process of replacing his own traditional income in the Navy with passive cash flow uh, by purchasing uh, rental properties. And that's kind of what led him to this whole journey. And he started helping investors set up IBC policies after going through it himself. Uh, he's actually from a dairy, he originally comes from a dairy farm in rural southern Illinois and lives with his wife Sue and their two sons on the central New Jersey coast. So with that, I want to hand it over to Gary. Gary, do you want to share your screen? I'm going to stop sharing. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for that kind introduction. And uh, I've, I've learned quite a bit. You're a very busy lady. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was a trip that made me tired just listening to all this stuff you've been doing during, uh, dur during our quarantine period. I was on a mastermind yesterday with Kyle Wilson and, and um, Elisa Haitian was, was talking about uh, her. She's, a, she's an entrepreneur and, and a coach for um, many in Hollywood and um, very impressive speaker. The thing that really blew me away though is she said, you know, I, I was so excited that I was going to get back all this time to do all my projects. And she was like, I'm more busy than ever. And, and I've experienced the same thing. And it sounds like you're doing the same thing. Um, I think, I think people who are naturally, um, you know, you know, uh, entrepreneurs or people who are of their of their business, it, it's just going to keep going. Is there a problem with audio or no? A little bit, but, um, I might, I might turn off my record video if it's there if it's an issue but i think you can keep going for now okay okay yeah just let me know yeah, sure. so and you can see my video right the yes. the infinite, yes, infinity banking okay awesome well again thank you everyone for joining i think um kavitha did a great job of uh explaining uh kind of you know my background one of the things that um the reason i put this slide on here is because i think everyone comes through life with uh with their experiences certainly but they also come a little bit of baggage right because their experiences drive their perspective in life and so i think it's helpful to just you know learn a little bit about mine and, and where i came from kavitha mentioned i grew up on a dairy farm this was the 70s and 80s so <laughs> a little bit older than some of you on this on this uh, webinar um, just turned 51 and I was like 13 or 14 years old in 1987 and no, I was, uh, I'm sorry, in like 1983 and four and just getting ready to enter high school. Um, and if you remember back then, this is when Ronald Reagan had not yet broken the back of high interest rates and we had a farm and we had variable interest rates loans on our farm and all of the equipment. And it was 
probably um, 15 to 18% interest rates. And it was consumed. I can remember not being able to cover the interest. Um, we had two advisors that would show up all the time. One advisor was our banker, and he would come about two years after the last time he visited. And that's when all of these variable interest rates were resetting. And um, please let me know there in the, in the uh, chat window if things are not going well on, on um, audio. It looks like Kavitha just asked if we're having audio issues. I'll take a pause. Yeah, here I to think we're having some okay, audio bit. issues. I was hearing that a little bit, Kavitha. All right. I think, uh, Gary, it might help if you just call in on your phone or turn off your video, maybe. Um, sometimes the video kind of hurts the audio, so I don't know if you want to try. Okay, okay. I can, yeah, let me, let me stop that. I can. Um... Yeah, it might okay. help. Okay, so I'll stop my video. video. If, that, if, if, yeah, the video me... does, if the video does not help it, I can change um, audio channels. I can change channels on the internet, but that may cause an interruption here on my side. So just let yeah, me, did it help? Are we, do we have better audio? So far it looks, it's looking good. It's sounding good. Okay. Yeah. Please just let me know in chat. So two, two advisors, one was the banker and he would come in and kind of save us, but he would put in place this thing that was going to eat us alive in two or three more years. And then, uh, then there's this life insurance guy. My parents always hated the life insurance guy coming around because they knew what he was, what they, he was going to tell them was the truth that they didn't have enough coverage and that it was gonna be a bill that came, you know, a savings plan that showed up like a bill and they couldn't afford the bill at the time. Um, and so um, we ended up losing that farm or essentially losing it. We sold it at the last moment and kind of walked off, walked out with a shirt on our back. To give those who didn't go through that in America the perspective, my father bought the farm with $65 an acre in, in costs, about a thousand acres, and ran a dairy for about 20 years. And then when he sold it, he sold it for over $2,000 an acre and barely had enough to pay off the loans. Um, it was tremendous. High interest rates are something to definitely pay attention to. And I, you know, it was many years before I really understood the impact of why we just could not get ahead, but we couldn't. And here I am in high school uh, and I had spent so much time around my father. He was sick by this point. Um, the, the, you know, the experience had really kind of worn out as hell. Um, but I wanted to get the heck out of Illinois. We were living on a trailer and, and families, uh, on, a, on families, you know, borrowed land and really had nothing. I had to work a couple jobs just to get the down payment to go to the Naval Academy. And they offered me an education and I jumped at it. And really the reason I jumped at it was, um, was primarily for the, the secure job that I would have going forward. And so they dropped me off and 25, 26 years later, I hung up my uniform. Um, lots of amazing times between, um, between those two. And Kavitha, if you can still hear me, if you wouldn't mind just hitting something in the chat window, uh, making sure everything's good. So I, I had, uh, works good, okay. So I had a tremendous time in the Navy. I loved my time uh, with my crew. That, I'm standing on my ship here, but the one behind it is, is very similar. I was on four submarines. Um, amazing, amazing people you get to work with in the nuclear submarine force. And it, it was wonderful. Yet, as I was walking off of my ship and, and kind of decompressing after a couple of really, really hard years deploying across the globe with that ship, um, I started to think back to moments um, on the top left picture where, you know, I'm on my father's back there, right? And I'm spending 24 seven around that guy. And I realized that my kids weren't experiencing any of that, that I had been chasing income. I'd been chasing net worth to the point where I was really kind of putting at risk the most important things out there. And that is time, one-on-one -on -one parent child time, right? You, you truly do have to put in the time. I have a great friend, Jim Shields, who runs a program called 18 Summers. And the point of his program is that you get 18 summers to impact the lives of your children, and then they vote. And I have an 18-year-old right now. But going back five or six years, I made this decision that I needed to get back into their lives, and I needed to get back some time and give my wife an opportunity to kind of run her career. So we made some changes. Um, Another thing that was going on at the time is that this was 2009, 10, and 11, and I had lost a tremendous amount of money in the stock market. I had my money um, in the place that most people have their money, which was with a broker, handed off my money to somebody else, and allowed uh, just kind of 
and went on autopilot and let them do the work. And I decided I needed to take back some control. I needed to also be accountable for my money and pay more attention. And so this pyramid was a huge aha moment for me. We call it the hierarchy of wealth. And you'll find it in this book here by my mentor, Patrick Donahoe. He's the CEO of Paradigm Life and my business partner now. He was my advisor back in 2011 when I was learning all of this. Um, and in his book, in chapter seven, he talks about this pyramid. We'll let you know, Kavitha has a, has a tremendous offer that she has kindly uh, put out to you all. And, and we'll explain that here at the end of the presentation um, for all three of these, actually. And, and like I said, a huge aha moment for me. And what we learned in studying the wealthy and what they do is that they have a tremendously strong tier one. Tier one is really a foundation. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then tiers two through four, that's where the investments are in our personal financial lives. We kind of, we adapted this from Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you remember Maslow, or if you ever came across that, right? Food, shelter, and clothing are down here. Self-actualization, you know, kind of the goal at the top, but you don't really ever need to get there to have a great life, but you definitely need to solve the bottom, right? And so in the financial side of things, that's really savings and protection at the bottom. And then uh, as you go up, through these tiers, risk goes up. And um, the reason it does essentially is because on the other side, control and your insight into what's happening is going down. And so let's look at a couple examples of that. Um, you know, primarily the, the wealthy have stayed down here in tiers one and two, and the, um, the middle class have been up in, in tier four most of the time. And you think about, um, well, let's talk about what these guys are, right? So direct investing. Direct investing is something where it's directly within your control, your rental properties, um, your business. But the first and foremost is yourself, right? I think most people do not get that they are their family's financial number one best asset, hands down. Any of you that, ha that are high income earning professionals or running your own business, it is you, not the business, right? Not the employer that's keeping your family safe. And if you do own a business like I do, then you know the business is really an extension of you and it's successful because of you. Um, if you have rental properties that you're directly making decisions on, again, they're being pretty successful because of your involvement in them. And you know, as you go up from here, um, I spend most of my time today in direct investing with people like Kavitha and other friends of mine that I have learned um, are, are ethical individuals that I can leverage my time, right? I want to, because I'm inspired, spend my time on these two. I do have 30 doors personally. Um, they became complex and now I'm investing in mobile home parks and apartment buildings and other things that I can connect up with very ethical people like Kavitha and like my other dear friend, Mavi, who's, who's on here with us this evening, right? So people who can successfully bring value and integrity and returns to those that are busy professionals out there. And so that's investing in somebody else's business, right? Or somebody else's um, offering or syndication. And I'm doing that a, a lot now. And I really am not at all in speculation. I draw a picture of the stock market in speculation because that's where most of us uh, are doing our speculating. But you can also do it in real estate, right? You could buy into a real estate investment trust and buy shares in a business that really you have no idea what they're doing. Listen, I love Apple computers and Apple stock. I think Steve Jobs was a genius and I think the company's still doing tremendous. But what if they decided tomorrow at a business uh, board meeting that they're going to bring back the A-track take player and the record player and maybe just throw in car carburetors just in case, right? Well, they didn't ask me and I won't even know they're going to do it until the stock price tanks, right? So you, you really are not in control and you're not in the know. That's really the big thing about this. Fundamentally, starting at the foundation, moving to that, that second tier and then graduating up from there when you have plenty of bricks down here is just tremendous. And this, again, for, like I said, maybe over emphasizing a little bit, but this was tremendous for me. And again, what we're going to spend most of our time talking about this evening is the foundation down here, the high cash value uh, life insurance side. And so this is a filter that I use for all of my investments and I use it for all of my clients. And so we populate this and we re revisit it sometimes monthly with my clients I've been doing it for years with a few clients that really value that and have enough questions and enough 
kind of moving pieces for that to be valuable. I do it at least annually and often it's quarterly with my clients to talk about wh where do we need, where we have missing blocks, et cetera. And um, I look forward to any of you who feel like that might be a fit to doing that with you as well. But what I do is I start with a foundation, right? And we're gonna talk today about the foundation. And truly that's my day job. Hey Gary, we are having some uh, issues right now. And what I mean by it, I'm helping people save my location. Hey Gary, we lost you. Wanna just pick up and talk for a couple of minutes? Uh, yes, I'll keep talking while you probably you can just log in through your phone audio. All right, I'll keep talking here. So while Gary is uh, getting his audio issues sorted out, so I just wanted to say something really quick here. Um, myself, right, I did, I have a real estate portfolio of rentals, like rental properties that I directly manage. Um, that, so I directly invest in them. So that's the tier two. And I have a lot of tier three investments. So I invest in multifamily syndications and I do a lot of speculation as well. So I would say a lot less speculation, a lot less money in the stock market now than I ever did. Uh, but when I started in um, investing, we all know nothing but the tier four investing. We know and we've been exposed to Wall Street, which says, hey, you know, you put all your retirement money into Wall Street. You put all your retirement money in mutual funds and it's somehow safe. And we've gone through quite a few downturns and seen how safe it is. And we've lost quite a bit of money and then spent the next five years recovering what we lost. So the compounding effect of money is really hurt when that happens, when you have a downturn and you lose and you start all over again. So what I found in my own journey is that when I looked at these tiers, my tier one is actually really poor. Uh, I didn't really set up a whole, whole lot as far as savings and protection. And I just basically started building with tier twos, three and fours. So that's something that I would, Gary and I will talk about uh, a little bit more today, uh, a lot more today. So I hope it, it, it makes sense when we're done. Uh, Saurabh, do you have a question? I know you raised your hand. Meanwhile, we're gonna give, give Gary some uh, time to come back in. Uh, are there any questions so far or any comments? Uh, Bob is asking if he gets, can get a copy of the slides. Uh, I usually, we usually don't give out a copy of slides, but we will be sharing the recording of the presentation, Bob. So I will try to cut out all this uh, waiting period here and there as well. So Ram, do you have a question? You just raised your hand. What is savings and protection again? So we're talking about um, savings in terms of, so when we start building and going into real estate investments or whatever kind of investments, uh, then you wanna make sure that you have enough cash reserves and protection of your income. So let's say I'm a 40, I'm 45, or I'm almost 45, and I have a certain income every year. So I take that income and talk you know, let's say I'm going to be working for the next 20 years. What happens if something goes wrong, right? Like what happens if something goes wrong with me? How am I protecting my family? So protection is, is basically protecting your income and protecting your family when things go wrong. As far as savings is concerned, I'll give you a great example of savings. Uh, when the COVID issue first happened, I was thinking about my own issue, my own situation. I have a lot of rental properties and I was really unsure about how or if the tenants are going to pay. So what happens in that case? So a lot of people who actually fail in real estate fail mostly because of two reasons. One is the lack of cash reserves. So if you're working, you, you have a portfolio, and but you don't have the right amount of cash reserves to hold on to that portfolio, then you really are liable, likely to lose it in a foreclosure or whatever, right? So the cash reserves are really important. But at the same time, let's say I put my cash reserves, I typically put it in a bank account, which makes 0.75, maybe 1.5, if that, 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 that's kind of like pushing it. Uh, it really isn't growing at the rate that I want it to grow. 
So that's kind of what I mean by building that strong tier one where you, you want to build your savings and you want to have that protection because without that, you're basically building, uh, you know, without a strong base. Uh, so another thing I have noticed recently is the people like our apartment investments, right? I, I want to I want to talk a little bit about that while Gary is joining in. Is um, Gary, please let me know when you're on. Uh, so the apartment investments we've had, the folks who actually will make it through the the bad season, right? When the tenants don't pay or we lose income, are the people with that solid base, the tier one base, where they have good cash reserves, they're able to go through it, go through a downturn or go through um, without any, um, like if the tenants don't pay, let's say 40% of the tenants don't pay. And we don't know how this whole thing is gonna turn out, but the point I wanted to make here is that tier one is really important. And I just want to try to give you some examples of that. Hey Gary, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. That was awesome. I really appreciate it. I heard most of what you talked about. Great job. Um, I changed channel, so no internet issues anymore. Turns out Sunday evening with webinars can be a challenge on this side too, I guess. <laughs> All the neighbors are catching up with stuff, I guess. Um, so thanks, thanks for your help on that. So one of the things that one of my mentors told me that has always carried, that I've always carried with me and I found it to be extremely valuable. Um, and this comes from a quick story, I'll tell you, um, that, well, first of all, my family didn't understand this pyramid when I was a little guy, right? We, we had no idea. We just kind of blew around with however the economy pushed us around, right? We just didn't understand why we didn't have any control of anything. Um, and then um, very recently, in fact, during this event, I, I have two clients, very interesting. They're quite similar, yet they're experiencing this event totally opposite. I don't know if you've heard the, the comment or the saying, it's often in personal development um, kind of webinars that um, if that the word crisis in China and Chinese has two meanings, right? China, crisis and opportunity. And I've always thought that um, they're trying to get me to say, hey, listen, you get to choose how you respond to something that happens in life. Coronavirus happens, business shuts down, you get the choice to respond. And I've always thought that's kind of actually kind of tough. Like most people in the moment can't just choose. Like I know intellectually I shouldn't be afraid or worried, but a lot of people still are. And I noticed that with client after client after client during this period, like what I did was just double my effort in speaking with individuals to help them out in their situation, to provide value and provide opportunities for them, resources and resolution for them. And after meeting dozens and dozens of people, I came across these two pilots in the same week. One pilot's a Delta Airlines pilot. Um, he, they, he's um, a captain with Delta and he has um, 20 years or he, he makes $200,000 a year, does really well. But you know, the other thing is that he has got a large direct investment. He has um, a $200,000 net coming in on four mobile home parks that he and his wife own. They live on less than 100000 a year. So they had money coming from everywhere, right? Yet he was concerned about what the future looked like. What if all my tenants don't pay? What if Delta, you know, uh, doesn't, you know, what if they in October say that I'm not going to be a pilot anymore? So the interesting thing is that he was actually very worried, but yet intellectually, I could look at his situation and say, man, you have nothing to worry about. Um, worst case scenario and you're fine. And then there was the United pilot. And this gentleman had joined United in 2001, right before 9-11. Interestingly, when we took a look at his finances, he had $600,000 sitting in three bank accounts down here in the bottom of this thing. And I asked him, what's your story? Like that's more than most people have for their emergency savings. And, and I said, is that for investments? He says, oh no, that's my kind of bottom line. When it gets bigger than that, I'll use it for investments. And I said, please tell me your story. It's inspiring. And he said, I joined uh, United right before 9-11. Three months after I joined, they parked all the aircraft in the desert in Nevada. And he said, for months, I thought my family was going to starve. And so um, it had such an impact for him that, um, and I'm, I'm pulling up Q&A, and I think I might have lost the chat window for some reason. So I'm just trying to make sure, there we go. Okay. I'm just trying to monitor it, Kavitha, in case we have any issues. Yeah, um, no, we are good. I'll, keep, I'll, I'll monitor it. You just keep going. Thank you, ma'am. All right. So, so what he told me was, 
I thought that, you know, six months of income was adequate. And then I thought my family was going to starve. And he said, if I decided to stick with this investing and this airline industry, I'm going to have a tremendous amount of money sitting around. And it was quite an aha moment for me because I also came into this event, obviously didn't know it was coming with the idea that, uh, well, it wasn't really an idea. I just had some investments that had finished up and I'd sold a couple of properties. I had quite a bit of cash sitting in my foundation and it allowed me to just see opportunity. And so that was the big difference I saw with these two gentlemen. And then I see with many, many people that I meet with, they're polarized. There's people who are afraid of what might come around the next corner. And there's people who are excited about what might come around the next corner. And it's not just about having a lot of money sitting around, but that's a big part of it. Because for most of us, um, you know, what enacts fear today? Because when fear enacts, or when we get caught up in fear, kind of the reptilian brain is, uh, you know, releases the chemicals and we no longer are thinking logically. Um, maybe, you know, you can have a conversation with somebody and you know that one plus one equals two, but you're not willing to see if that's what comes around the corner. And so you still have this fear kind of taken over from the intellectual side. So for me, I learned, and many of my clients have learned, if there's enough cash to prevent the craziness from happening, it'll keep a clear head and I can keep looking forward. And I'm not saying that's the solution for everyone, but it's the solution for many of my clients. So let's talk about that side of things. So, you know, one of the things that's a key concept of this is when I was talking about you being your number one best asset, and you'll see that me keep coming back around to this numerous times. So, but an, a, another aspect of that is just total income and total wealth. And, you know, many, this probably fits very closely for quite a few of you on this, on this podcast or on this webinar. And so 42 years old, planning on finishing up and retiring around 65, you're currently making 150,000. Um, you'll keep up your income will keep up with inflation and uh, you have a hundred thousand dollars right now to invest. And let's say you can invest it at 6%, pretty common stuff, right? And it's, you know, but it's probably surprising to you that you're going to have that, that equation is $4.8 million flowing through your fingers throughout your working years. Most of us would say, no, come on, that math's got to be messed up. There's no way that I'm going to have $4.8 million come in my paychecks, right? And before tax, you would in that very conservative, simple example. But here's the other thing that's probably more important, um, that if you had a way in which you could grow all that money, now, of course, we've got to spend some of it, right, on, on lifestyle. But if you could grow all of that, it would be more than $10 million. And so how do I access my dollars for at least the major purchases and still allow it to grow and compound in that environment, in a pretty powerful environment, right? So during your lifetime, you're going to create buckets of money. And these buckets are going to be a little bit different. And so as I went searching for what's the best way to build that foundation and fund those investments and fund that retirement, um, I found that there's essentially three different kinds of buckets. The first one in the pre-tax pre -tax accounts, IRAs, 401ks, et cetera, I call that Congress's playground. Why do I call it Congress's playground? Because Congress created it. And every time we have uh, a tax law change, like the 2018 tax law change or the CARES Act or um, the SAVE Act or any of the other great ones, right? Um, they have to somehow fund that tax cut or, or you know, the changes or the benefits that are given out to different groups throughout time. And how do they fund that? Well, they've only got the purse strings for one thing. And that is the ability to change tax law associated with retirement accounts to generate revenue from that. As an example, the, um, the SECURE Act, the one that uh, came out last year, which was uh, kind of aimed at providing better retirement benefits for us. It moved out Social Security benefits, uh, required, or required minimum distributions a few years. Well, it also said that IRAs that you are in 401ks and things that you inherit from your parents you have to distribute it now over 10 years. Why is that? Because it's gonna happen during your working years. It's gonna happen over a shorter period of time and both of those spell higher tax rates and much more revenue for the government, right? So there's billions of dollars, over 60, sorry, over $60 trillion in retirement accounts. And it's really the only option they have. So it's their playground. Um, Post-tax money, well, at least you were able to lock in whatever tax rate, what the deal was. See the problem with the pre-tax money, going back there again real quick, is that yes, we don't have to pay taxes today. And our CPA always says, man, I saved you a bunch of money. The problem is we wrote a blank check to the government because 
we don't know what the tax rate is going to be. We don't know what our personal situation is going to be out there in the future. And we really can't control it. Right. So you're, you're, you're basically saying here, um, you know, I, I will, uh, I'll pay you at whatever rate happens to be around in the future. And that's pretty scary, especially when we continue to change the rules associated with it. Hey, Gary, I want to say something here. Yeah. Uh, the, the big assumption everyone makes here is somehow that their taxable income will be lower at retirement than when they are actually yeah. putting the dollar in, which is can be so untrue. It's yeah. like, do you really want to die poor or live poor after retirement? Most of us don't. <laughs> we want to keep our lifestyle, right? right. I think the pre-tax dollars contributions only make sense when your employer is matching because mm -hmm. now you have an incentive to actually put it in there. Yeah. Yeah. And there's special situations where it might make uh, particular sense. I live in the wonderful state of New Jersey. My taxes are through the roof. I'm mm -hmm. moving in two years. And these current two years, I'm trying to protect some money. So I'm actually utilizing that for a very short window here. Um, I would just be careful, like you said. Great, great points. So in the post-tax world, um, only the growth is taxed, right? Because you've already paid taxes on the rest of it. And then there's tax-free. And tax-free outside of Congress's playground is titled high cash value, whole life insurance, permanent life insurance. So you know, if you were to take out $80,000, right, that you needed to live on, let's say, um, then in the pre-tax world, you're in the somewhere around $50,000 that you get. In the after-tax world, maybe 70, right? You're getting much better because generally this, these uh, capital gains are taxed much lower. But over here, it's $80,000. And so the money that you've grown is going to stretch much, much further. Um, Okay, so you know what bucket would you use if you were starting today to look at these different buckets? So that's one aspect of it. And then I went and I just looked at, hey, you know, as you're thinking about where you're going to store your money, um, how safe is it? How liquid is it? Will I get a return? And if so, how big is it? And then what's the tax impact of it? And so we've talked about some of that. And you know, we've we've looked at you know the qualified accounts or the pre-tax accounts, um, and we've looked at stock portfolio. Home equity, I didn't say a lot about. The reason this kind of has this question mark on, you know, is it liquid? A lot of people have lessons that they've learned in the last couple of months about banks taking away lines of credit, but nowhere near as bad as what happened in 2008 and nine. And so many of you have probably come across an idea of like velocity banking or replacing your primary mortgage. That's a discussion for another day. Just be very careful and think back to that clue word, right? Do I have control? Do I ultimately, am I the person making the decision about whether that's going to be available for me when I need it or not? Um, and is it liquid and do I have full use of it? So I found, you know, probably not a surprise uh, when I looked at this analysis, all of my family's wealth is down here. Um, and then it's being deployed from that foundation because of the characteristics shown on this slide. All right, so let's talk about this river of money that's funding our life and dreams. So if you think about, again, go back to the money that's gonna flow through our fingers, that $4 million, right, that's flowing through our fingers during this period of time. We talked about, and I've reinforced three or four times, the biggest tank on this whole thing is the potential that's of what value you're gonna to bring to the world and what the world is gonna compensate you for all of that. It might be a, you know, a W-2 job, it might be your 1099, it might be an extension as a business of yours. But that money is going to flow down and it's going to reach this filter. And this filter is something we really got to pay attention to. And for most of us, that tax filter takes a tremendous amount. But then the rest of it goes through this pretty green pipe and down the drain. And that's not meant to be derogatory. Keeping water in the green pipe is the whole point of life, right? It's funding our lifestyle, it's seeing our children, it's having the retirement that we want to have. We all, though, start to think maybe... Um, I need to push some water up this future lifestyle pipe because my body might vote one day that I'm not going to be able to work at the level I'm working at today, or I may want to have a bigger life in the future, or I may want to leave something to my favorite church or my children. And so many people will talk to you about cutting down the amount of water that's going through this pipe, cut back on your current lifestyle. That's not me. I don't think that's an inspired life. And I think we can live an abundant inspired life. And, and so the first thing I tackle is how do we get this tax filter to be much, much smaller? And then once you've done that, and perhaps maybe think about a way in which you can even earn more by adjusting the number one asset, right? Um, and maybe getting an advanced degree, maybe starting a side business, um, maybe just being the best person at work and they promote you up to the higher level, right? 
But whatever it is, the combination of these two, we've developed a cash flow that didn't come out of our lifestyle. And we push it up this thing and eventually, I mean, and it goes to one of two pipes or both pipes, right? The pipe on the right-hand side has a lid on it and that's your safe tank. It's called savings. Many people call it a savings account. Um, I happen to call it high cash right whole life insurance right now because they're, they're equivalent, liquid, um, safe and growing, right? It just so happens that the life insurance grows in a, in a tax-free environment at a much higher rate and brings life insurance with it and it's more private. So there's a lot of benefits, but it's intended to replace that safe tank or, or sit beside your current savings accounts. And then there's another tank over here, the risk tank. And the risk tank doesn't have a lid. And so from time to time, my water evaporates out of that tank and I got to go refill it. Um, and I've done it in every asset class. This is not a statement about any asset class. I've lost money in real estate and stocks, uh, my own business. So it's not an, a statement about that. It's simply that these two tanks are very, very different. And if you ever get a, a thought in your head that your emergency fund is sitting in your safe stocks, you got to remember where your safe stocks are sitting in a place where they can evaporate. Everything in the market goes the same direction in 2001 and in 2009 and in 2020. So it's very important to remember you got to have this one over here. So let's talk about buying a rental house and how this kind of thing works, right? So in your safe tank, whether it's a savings account or a life insurance policy, um, you probably have some emergency savings and maybe you have some reserves for these properties or businesses that you have, but then you have opportunity dollars, right? And with a clear head and enough emergency money, so you don't have to worry about, you know, giving this up, you're out there looking for opportunities and the opportunities will seek you out when you're in that situation. And most people, when they want to buy a rental house, for example, would go get a big bank loan. I'm a huge fan of that. 30 year fixed rate financing is incredible. And it's the same reason Kavitha gets it on her properties, right? This amazing financing when you can kind of refinance out to something longer and, and fixed. Cheap money. Um, I'm sorry? Cheap money. That's right. That's right. I call it dumb money too, Kavitha. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever said that to you. But, but it's not that I'm trying to insult my good friend, Aaron Chapman, who is my mortgage professional and superstar. It's that their money can only do one thing. Money that my credit union will lend me at 2% for to buy a brand new car, that's dumb money too. Meaning that I can't use it to take my family on vacation. I can't use it for any purpose that I need it for, right? But this life insurance policy, I can. So I use as much dumb money as I can because it's got this specific purpose. And stovepipe money maybe is a more conventional way to say it. But um, so that's, yeah, the cheap money, exactly. And then, um, and then typically they would empty out their opportunity dollars and put it over here as a down payment of property. I call that house jail because now I've locked up my money. And if I say, oops, sorry, I want that back. I can't do that without selling the property, right? It's going to be there for the duration of the time that I have. But if you have your money stored in this other kind of safe vehicle, then you can go to the insurance company and you can borrow their money and you just pledge dollar for dollar your money. Um, and so they put their money into the property and you've borrowed both the primary mortgage and the second one, none of your own money in the property. Obviously that improves the performance of the property, but it also improves the performance of your dollars because they're not in house jail and they're sitting over here. They got a new job, right? They're doing two jobs now. Now they're collateral for a loan, but you didn't take them out. So they still got guaranteed increases and they got dividends or profits from this mutual insurance company. So storing the money in this other location has its advantages. And so let's just look at what does this mean long-term? Like, does it really make a big difference? Well, okay, a different guy, not too different. This one's 40 years old. He wants to contribute. He wants to save $20,000 a year. This is pretty close to where I was when I was 41 starting my policies. Um, he would like to have like not, he doesn't want to, doesn't want to be required to do 20,000 a year. He'd like to do more like 5,000 a year maybe but have the ability and the desire and the intention to do the full 20. So you've got this kind of range. So he, he has a minute and a max and it's flexible and he likes it. Um, and he's going to contribute for 30 years. And uh, he's in the highest tax bracket. And um, this, the assumptions on the insurance return is that it's got 4% guaranteed underlying things. That's true for all of our companies. And then um, about a 2% dividend that sits on top. So, Here's the result. And I've got the, the, if we want to do this during question and answers and we have time, I know I kind of blew a little bit of time there with the, 
with the video, but if we have time and somebody needs to see the stuff or we can make it available in a follow-up video as well. So the insurance policy um, nets 1.34 million and that's a 5.37 internal rate of return on that 30 years. A savings account in a 35% tax bracket paying taxes on it every year would have to do 8.26% to pay the taxes and still end up with the same money. And I don't know how you're going to do that in any environment with a savings account for 30 straight years. And so we went to a managed investment and paid some management fee on it. Um, and then it was 10. So this just shows you that I, you know, I should go back and show you the tank picture. And I said, this is a safe tank, right? It's not an investment. A managed investment account making 10.14 for 30 years, that's a great investment, right? With no down years. Um, that would be amazing, but this is not an investment. It's a safe tank. And I'm just saying, you got to really have a high performing investment to keep up with the safe tank over that period of time. So there are those out there, Dave Ramsey is a great example, who does a tremendous job helping people who are be, become, they're in quicksand of credit card debt. And he's teaching them kind of the first level college course that we didn't learn in high school, unfortunately, about the fact that compounding interest working against you with this picture on the left-hand side can eat you alive. You'll get in a situation where you're just servicing the interest and then, and then you can't service the interest and you're in bankruptcy, right? Or homeless. And he helps people cut up the credit cards and get into a savings world. And he does a tremendous job. But I'm going, to make a, I'm going to make a really wild assumption that most of the people on this phone call or on this webinar, that's, this isn't them. And you guys are seeking, and you're going to all of Kavitha's webinars to find out what is the graduate course. Like what's next, right? Because this doesn't get me to where I want to go, which is a bigger pyramid, right? And so the graduate course says, hey, by the way, do you remember in the first level course where you learned about the power of compounding interest? Well, if you flip it and do what the wealthy do, which is use it in your advantage instead of against you, then it has the same impact, but pushing you up that pyramid of wealth. And so this is really just intended to be a pictorial version of, of how you can use this. And I'll show a, a couple of different ways of it. But once you've saved money, just like you would in a savings account, and it could all happen in the first year, I did that with mine. I invested, I borrowed against my policy three days after um, getting it in place because it took a while to get it in place while I was active duty in the military. And it was late and I needed to close on that first property. It was already you know, finished and the, everyone was waiting on me. So I did it and it worked. I moved a larger sum of money. It worked fine. Most people will save over a couple of years, just like they would in their savings account. But then when they use the money in this case, again, you're borrowing against it, right? And so when you've repaid your loan, you realize, oh my gosh, I'm not where I would have been had I just refilled my savings account. So I'll, t I'll talk a little bit more about that. But this was just intended to be a quick example of, you know, just a visual of compound interest is powerful, um, but it can work for you too. And here's an example of it working for you. So this shows the, the power of uninterrupted compounding. If you took $1,000 a month and put it into an account for 30 years, this is what would happen. If you could earn, if you could grow it at, I think it was 6% it was growing here. And so this is funny because this is where I was in 2008 and nine. I was just finishing up, so I, could fin I could have left the military at 20 years. I didn't, I left out here, but I could have left here. And I was scratching my head because I was like, I've been saving 25 to 50% of my income. Remember, I grew up pretty poor. I was focused. Um, I had been saving it for 20 years. And I was just expecting that this hockey stick would be happening for me at that point, but it wasn't. Um, and I didn't really understand why. And then I realized after seeing a picture like this, that what I've been doing is saving for four years, buying a car, saving for four years, buying a house, saving for four years, the next big investment or, or purchase and doing it again. And every time I was resetting the clock and I'd never seen more than five years of compounding interest in my lifetime until I changed what I was doing. So how is it possible that you can pay interest on a loan from the insurance company that's comparable size, like it's basically the same interest size as what you're earning on your compounding um, policy and make out? Like, why does it make sense to do that? Well, some of it is because we have that emergency money in there and we got those reserves in there and we're not going to borrow that. So that money is just earning in that tax-free compounding world. But the money you pledged is collateral on the bottom that we looked at. So the, the reason that you can 
borrow 50,000 to 6% while you're saving 50,000 to 6% and you end up paying 46,000 in interest while you make 164,000 down here in interest, doesn't seem like that's reasonable, right? But it's because you have a simple interest loan an amortized loan going on up top. And down at the bottom, you've been saving this money this whole time in a compounding environment, right? And so that math works pretty, pretty easily and pretty well. Just grab a financial calculator off of Dinky Town, um, or I can work it out for you um, when we get together after this. Okay, so I call it the and asset. So we build up a little bit of cash in here. And again, it, you could do it in a couple of days if, if that is the path that you're taking. And then you can make major purchases throughout life. So I call a major purchase anything that you can't cover with your monthly expenses. Now, listen, for some of us, that's a new set of tires. For some of us, that's a major vacation. And, and for some of us, it's something much bigger, like a car, right? And But you can take a loan against your policy to buy what Robert Kiyosaki calls a doodad. This is really not my first choice of what you would use this for, but you can, right? And then you can use cash to make the payments back. The same cash you'd be using to refill your savings and checking account. So that, that's totally doable, right? What I like to see people do though for their first ones is use it for an investment. Buy a rental property, invest in one of Kavitha's tier three assets or um, you know, purchase a business or something. And then the reason I like using it for this is because it has ready made in the process cash flow coming from the asset to be used to kind of repay it. So hopefully that, that kind of makes sense as well. Um, okay, I might be moving a little fast, but now I'm gonna just do a side-by-side -side of using cash as a down payment and using a loan against your life insurance policy as a down payment. This does throw the numbers into it. Um, if you'd like, you can try a quick screenshot of what's coming up next, but I think it will be confusing for you. Um, we'll have to talk through it maybe in an example afterwards or during, uh, again, during a kind of a follow-up meeting. So our assumptions are that we're going to do 20% down on a house. Um, and the others that are listed here, which are pretty common, right? And there's no loan if you're going to take the money and dump it out of your account and put it in house jail, right? No loan. Um, your savings account, when you're refilling it with the cash flow from the property, is earning a quarter of a percent, and you're in the highest uh, tax rates or in the higher tax rates. Okay, and you start immediately because you have the twenty thousand sitting around ready to go, and we'll assume you have emergency money sitting elsewhere. All right, so the same thing over here, except that um, we're going to borrow against this and pay it back over five years uh, with the cash flow from the property, and then. We also have an interest and this company happens to have four and three quarters interest rate loan. And the internal rate of return on the policy is five and three quarters or five, a little over five. Um, and no out of pocket tax because this is a non-taxable event when you borrow against your policy. Um, and we're gonna wait a year to start. Now, why are we waiting a year? I told you I didn't personally. I'm kind of making the assumption that this is all the money you had. And so in the first couple of years, there will be a little bit of limited access. Maybe 20, 25% is limited on access when you get this started. And it all comes back to you by year six or seven. But at the beginning, it's a little bit slower. So I just said, hey, let's assume they only had 20. And so if they start the policy, they're only going to have like 16 or 15 available on day one. Okay. So here's what happens if you're using a savings account. So the individual does that first loan and they're paying it back and they're also making their contributions into the policy. And then once they have enough, they do the next one and then the next one and they're making bigger and bigger loans, right? And so they're just reinvesting all of the available dollars in these properties. And they end up with $1.57 million in 30 years. Not bad, you know, pretty solid. So what happens with the life insurance? They start a year later, first of all, and the fact that the dollars are growing, com they're compounding, doing two jobs, and the cash flow is coming back and is, is also growing in that tax-free environment, it earns a million dollars more over that same period of time. And again, it just goes back to that compounding versus amortized and your money growing in the tax-free environment at a much higher rate. Okay, so I'll just, I'll shoot that, I'll shoot through that real quick again. So 1.57 here, 2.7 here. Okay. That was a lot of numbers. I don't want you to stare at the numbers. Okay, sometimes people ask, hey, are these insurance companies safe? Well, it's true, they don't have FDIC. Um, 
FDIC, by the way, if you go study that, is an interesting beast. Um, it is kind of sitting around with the assumption that the government is going to print money to, if they ever have to execute FDIC. It's about 7% funded, or it was before this crisis, probably maybe a little lower, but it's around that, single digits. And the other 93%, they're going to have to come up with by doing what we're doing now, which is quantitative easing, right? Um, but it, this is not subjected to FDIC. Um, rather, it's backed by the strength of a 200 plus year old company that has been profitable every year since they've been in existence. And I'm not talking about one company, I'm talking about Mass Mutual, Penn Mutual, New York Life, American United Life, um, Guardian, lots of companies. I work with over 10. They're all mutual, they're all huge, they're billion dollar companies, and they um, have paid profits every year through the Great Depression back into the early 1800s predating the, F, the Federal Reserve and our tax code. Um, it's a contract. It's a legal contract that you can uphold in court if they do not give you the guaranteed results that they promise you on the illustration before you start. Um, the company is not able to do something called fractional reserve banking. If you're not familiar with that, Google it. It's what banks can do. And at the beginning, you know, before this crisis, this past two months period, um, it has, uh, the banks were generally limited to nine or 10 multiply, multi, multiplier on uh, fractional reserve, which means grandma puts $1,000 in the account, they can lend out $1,000 to nine or 10 different people. At the beginning of this event, they, the Federal Reserve withdrew all limitations on that and it was unlimited on multiplying the money because they needed to get liquidity back out in the environment. Um, so the insurance companies can't do that. And in my opinion, that's what's kept them profitable through the Great Depression 2000, 2008, and many other problems that have occurred in the past. Um, they use some other things like a reinsurance program to protect them uh, if it's necessary. And then there's a state guarantee association, which unlike FDIC is actually funded with cash. It's audited every year by the feds, quite ironically. Um, and it's there to prove that if an insurance company ever were to go out of business and they weren't absorbed by another company, then um, the state would step in with three to five hundred thousand dollars of cash or death benefit as whichever one is being lost by the family. Okay, hey, Gary, how how big is the state guarantee fund? Like generally, let's yeah, say so you have to you have to. That's a great question. So how big is it? It depends on every state. Mm -hmm. I would say if you had, if you average them, if you wanted to see the median or what most of them are like, it's, you know, let's say 250,000 cash value, 500,000 death benefit, but you'd have to go and actually look at each state and, and what they specifically do. Um, great question. Are we okay on audio still? Yeah, we are great. Perfect. Perfect. So another big question I get, what's, uh, how expensive I've heard life insurance is too expensive. Um, so one of the things I can tell you is that the guaranteed return that these things have, they guarantee that there's going to be more money in this account than you've contributed throughout your lifetime, which makes it really hard to answer what's the cost of the life insurance. I'm not sure because you're going to get back more than you put in. Uh, and so, I mean, I can't say it's free. Uh, there certainly is a cost of life insurance there, but it's, it grows well beyond any costs that are there. And if you do look at it and try to figure out what, what are the costs? The costs are generally in the first couple of years. And then after that, they're negligible. And uh, when you spread that out over the lifetime of an individual, it's well below 1%. It's better than um, Vanguard as far as management fees go, um, far better. And so a lot of times people get the misconception or they've maybe had a policy where there were a lot, a lot less liquidity, a lot larger fees. And, and the reason is because it wasn't designed the way we designed these. All right. And so that kind of gets to this step, right? It's, it's vital that you work with somebody who does this for their day job, that they, they, do, they do exclusively high cash value, whole life insurance policies. And when you do that, um, they will make sure that, you know, you're able to contribute as much as you want to be able to contribute. There's no limits on this. Um, and that you're minimizing expenses and charges and that you have unlimited access at any point um, and that you can get access in the form of loans or withdrawals, but if you do it in the form of loans, then you're not going to interrupt the compounding while you're able to reinvest the dollars and put them back to work. And here's an example. Here's a picture of how we redesign. So the left-hand side of this is what I call an ordinary whole life insurance policy. It's a base life insurance policy. 
And it's dollars being collected, grown over time, both guaranteed increases and profits. They give you access to it throughout your life, and then they hand it to your beneficiary. That's whole life insurance. It's a tremendous product. Yet it's not extremely liquid, nor extremely flexible on contributions at the beginning. And so we redesign it to the picture on the right-hand side. We take that base part that has to be there for all the tax benefits and the protections, and it's there, but it's as small as I can make it. Here it says a third. I generally get it down more like 20%. And the rest of it goes into something called paid-up additions. And in a first meeting, I talk about it as the cash part, and I draw it in green. I go through a lot of, lot of work to kind of make this as simple as I can. But essentially, we're taking a tried and true product that's never lost a penny for anybody for 200 plus years, and we keep it, but we accentuate a couple of attachments or riders, options you can put on it to make it liquid and growing fast and flexible for you. So hopefully that, that makes sense about why you hear stuff about life insurance that's the opposite of what I'm saying about it. So the catch, and this is, I think is our last slide. Um, what are the catches? Well, it's not really too many catches. I mean, it is life insurance. The underlying vehicle to get the tax benefits and the guaranteed growth uh, is life insurance. And I hope you see that as a value. I certainly do in my life. Um, you know, Kavitha made the comment that many people are getting uh, estate plans. You can bet they're also getting life insurance uh, because it's times like this where we realize that um, if we're not here, um, our family, the number one asset's gone, right? And so we could, our family could be in trouble. So there's a medical qualification side that's typically not that bad for people that I work with, you know, people in their 40s and 50s with families that are interested and that are high achievers. They're typically high achievers with their health as well. Um, there's a time capitalization factor of it, meaning that there's a little bit that's held back in the first couple of years and it takes uh, four to five years to get, or five to six years to get all that money back. So you maybe have only 80% access uh, in year one, as an example. There's some limitations. Government will limit on a specific policy what can be contributed, but there's no limit how big I make that policy at the beginning. When I said earlier, there was no limit. Um, and then like we saw in the previous picture, it just needs to be structured correctly. And Kavitha, I'm gonna turn it over to you while this picture is still showing to kind of talk about, um, oop, I went backwards, to talk about you know, what kind of steps they could take. Perfect. Thank you, Gary. Thanks so much. Uh, we will go through the questions in a second here. We have quite a few questions here. But before that, I just wanted to give you a heads up uh, that Gary and I were working together with this and we want to offer you a complimentary 30 minute consultation as well as a free copy of this book and a couple of other books, I right? Three books, right? We have, Gary? Yes. Yep. Yeah. I have uh, two other ones that I, I participated in or wrote myself. One of them is kind of a how-to book about this. And another one is just an amazing collection of, of stories that um, Kyle Wilson, the guy who, who ran Jim Rohn's program, put together for us. Perfect. So if you're interested in setting up the consultation, you can follow that link below. I will type it in the chat box as well. So feel free to just put in your name and the details here, there, and uh, we will set up a follow-up call and uh, we'll, we'll coordinate the time for that and also send you some free copies of reading materials that you can go through before or after the call if you wish. Mm -hmm. So let's get to the questions. Um, Let's do it. All right. Let's see. I have both of them up. Do you want to, I mean, if you want to read. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I'll can go. read however you think would be best. Sure. What about the tax benefits of cash value life insurance? Sure. That's an awesome question. So similar to a Roth IRA, for example, it's after tax money going into life insurance. Um, it's difficult and it's not to your advantage to hold life insurance inside a Congress playground type environment, right? So inside an IRA or a 401k. It's possible in some of those vehicles, but you end up wishing you hadn't later in life. And I'll get into those later for you. So it's an after-tax vehicle. It's out here in the real world so that there's no limitations, no prohibited transactions or, or access before 59 and a half, any of those issues. After-tax product. And because you put your money in after-tax, your the money should come out permanently tax-free in the end, even the growth. Now, if you take the growth out, the profits out, so unlike a normal savings account, the profits that you get every year, they're not taxed annually. They're, they just roll in here without tax, right? Inside the product. 
But if you were to physically take those out, like for, app, for some reason you had to surrender the policy or something, then you would get taxed on that money just like you would have if you'd earned it in a savings account, just the growth of it. But while it's in existence, high cash value, whole life insurance, whole life insurance has um, an amazing tax um, sequence that it goes through. So it's the opposite of most annuities or qualified accounts. Specifically, when you're taking money out of the account, permanently withdrawing money, not loans. Loans are always tax-free. But if you are withdrawing money, physically taking it out, which sometimes people do in retirement, um, the first money that comes out represents what you put in at the beginning. So it's called first in, first out treatment, which again is the opposite of what an annuity is, for example, that's last in, first out. So the first stuff coming out, you got to pay tax on, right? In this case, no tax until you have all of your original contributions back out. You've had that life insurance all that time, no cost now because you got all your money back. Um, and, but you, but now that all the profits are in there, now you can borrow against those the rest of your life without paying taxes. Or if you're actually are in the lower tax bracket, um, then you can take it out and pay the tax on it. So typically what people will do is they, maybe they'll take out their original contributions or they'll just borrow against stuff throughout their lives. And when it turns into a death benefit, it passes tax-free to the next generation or to your charity. Does that help? Absolutely. Uh, I think I had one more, sorry, I had one more comment on this. I got a little distracted there. Um, yeah. Okay, we'll just keep going. Um, so Dion asks, I might have missed this one, but the only way to take all of your money out is to cash in on a policy. That is surrendering a policy, correct? Right, so what we just talked about is that you can take withdrawals over time if you want to, or you can um, just take out your contributions at some point all in one, one lump sum if you want to. So there's no limitation on how much you withdraw and, or when you withdraw it. Um, but no, you can get your cash out that you've contributed um, and do that without tax. You can also pull out most of the profits. You can't pull everything out or it would cease to exist, but you can pull most of the profits out uh, and pay tax on those profits, or you could borrow against them to get the full value of it. What I'm trying to say is that if you had $500,000 in cash value and you had personally contributed $300,000, Dion, then you could pull out the $300,000 for no impact. And the other two hundred dollars would be profits. You can get the value of that 200 by borrowing it and never paying tax on it. Or you could physically withdraw it and pay the taxes on it if you'd like, or pass it on to family and they get it tax free. So his other question I think is interesting, which was also a question I had. Uh, if a policyholder were to die, the beneficiary would only receive the death benefit and lose the cash value. Yeah, yeah. So that's a great, uh, my, my friend Susie Orman talks about this all the time. And it's a huge misconception about how cash value works or how, how life insurance works. Um, and, and so I liken it, it's very similar. If you look at, at life insurance, it's almost identical to a, a rental property, for example. Um, you, you make contributions to it over the years, building equity inside this asset, right? So let's say you have a mortgage on your property and you're making contributions, you're making payments. Well, you will notice that once you've paid off the house, the bank will give you the deed to the house, but they don't turn around and give you all your payments back. And that's what would, that's the parallel to what people who make that comment, um, you know, you often hear that, hey, they, you know, when you die, you get the death benefit, but you don't get the cash value. But in fact, what's happening is the insurance company is collecting premiums, they're adding guarantees to it, and they're adding dividends or profits to it. The entire purpose of doing this collection is to get it ready to be big enough to turn into a death benefit in the future. One of the reasons that this comes up is because they'll kind of compare it to, cat, to, to term insurance. And they'll say, hey, well, if you just buy term insurance um, then, um, and invest your money somewhere else, then you get the insurance and the other thing. But the, the thing is, is that no one dies with term insurance in place. So really all you're getting is the other asset. So that's why there's kind of that misconception. Yeah, so also with the term insurance, let's say you have a term insurance to 20 years. After the 20 years, if you want to place insurance again, you know, let's say you outlive the term, then your insurance rates are going to be super high at that point. Whereas here you lock in the rate for the rest of your life. The other thing, actually, I, I was really, I really like this aspect. So you can actually call the insurance company and tell them, hey, translate my cash value 
to more death benefits. So you can actually move or convert. Gary, I'm right on that, right? Mm -hmm. You can actually tell them, hey, drop my cash value and move that to death benefit. So let's say I'm close to dying and I know I want more death benefit. I can actually make use of that, can't I? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. So it's guaranteed convertible over to permanent. Absolutely. Um, another question that came up was like, does the mortality expense get higher? Does the cost of insurance go up and up? Um, uh, and it does not for whole life insurance. In fact, the risk or the cost goes down to the insurance company as you get older. It seems really weird that that could be true. But if you think about like, um, why does the cost of term insurance go up when you get older? Like I always run this little joke, like it's hard to believe, but I did have this client who said, I want term insurance only. I can't stand whole life. It's too expensive. I want term insurance and I'm going to live to 110 years old. And he said, please get that for me. I didn't even know I couldn't get it. It was my first year in the business. And so I found Mass Mutual who would let him get one at age 89, which was his life expectancy year. And at age 89, though, his $1 million policy was $507,000 one year. And I said, my gosh, I even called them. I said, why would that be? Why would that be so expensive? And they said, well, think about it. Somebody comes walking into you and you're the insurance company and they say, this is my birthday and I'm supposed to die this year, but I'd like you to insure me for a million dollars. Like, what would you charge, right? So it totally makes sense on the term insurance side. They have a, they're flipping a coin whether they're going to have to pay you a million dollars that year or not and they haven't collected any money to make that happen. But what's happening with whole life insurance is they're collecting, protecting, and growing dollars. So in, at age 89, yes, he's got a 50% chance of passing away. It's a little less than that, but, um, but there's also, for that million dollar policy, there's like $800,000 in cash. The insurance company's only at risk for like 200 grand because like we pointed out a moment ago, they're gonna take that 800 and turn that into most of the 1 million. They just gotta come up with the other 100, right? And so, you know, kind of going back real quick, because I know that kind of sits rough with some people when we say that the cash doesn't come back to you, right? Um, and so I, I always tell people like the moment when you have a heartbeat and you're in the hospital bed, right? You can cancel your life insurance and get the cash value, get it all back, right? Be a terrible taxable event, but you could do that. Um, but the moment the heartbeat's gone, now the family has a massive, larger tax-free death benefit. So it's not a good idea to take the cash back, right? So if you look at like, what has been the return on my cash? We just looked at an example where it was like 5.5% a year, right? 5.37 or something, internal rate of return with no tax. That's on the cash value side. The death benefits side, it's a percent or a percent and a half higher than that. So if you just wait and let it play out, your family is going to get about a seven or more uh, tax-free rate of return on the money you had in there. And you had full access to it, just like you would have in your savings account. So, And also, isn't that free of estate taxes, uh, Gary? All uh, Any life insurance policy passed to your children? Uh, if you hand it to your children while you're alive, like shift ownership to them, mm -hmm. um, it will go outside of your estate. Um, but if you die and it's, and it's your policy, you're the owner, it is inside of your estate. It's so oh. easy to fix that. Anyone who has an estate planning challenge which today means if you're married, you got $25 million. Um, but if you have an estate planning challenge, we will make sure that it's in a trust or your children are the owners or something. So if it's in a trust, it passes without any problem. Right, because a, an irrevocable trust is right. not you. It lives on beyond you. Gotcha. Yeah. So this is out of the question Dion has. If your cash value exceeds the nor amount of your accumulated principal investment, you will have to pay taxes on the amount above principal. If you withdrew that money, if you physically withdrew it, but not to access it as a loan, nor to have it passed to your family. Got it. I hope that answers your question. If you have more, please keep asking them. We'll go through it. Uh, Ron asks, IUL versus whole life? My favorite question. <laughs> <laughs> you want to tackle it? <laughs> I'll let you talk. <laughs> you convince so, me. <laughs> so I have an entire, I have an email uh, toolkit that I send to anyone who would, who would uh, pass their information to Kavitha. And it's got, it's got me in a video going through and talking about IUL versus whole life. And it's got examples. I, I'm a collector. Some people collect belt buckles. I collect, or stamps. I collect IUL policies that have blown up on people. And so I, it's me going through this. And it says, hey, look, this one, here's the letter that went to the individual that said that they got five point something percent return this year. Here's one that says they got eight. Well, let's look at the account value. And the account value actually went down in some of those cases. 8% return, congratulations, your $147,000 of cash value is now 137. 
in my mind, that's not a positive return. How is that happening? Well, it's because index universal life insurance is term insurance with a savings account on it, but it's a savings account that you can adjust. And so many times they will make an assumption that your, your policy is going to return index to the markets or physically in the markets. You can do that with, with universal. It's going to do tremendously well. And it's going to do so well, you don't need to pay premiums or very little premiums. Well, it doesn't do that well most of the time. And one of the primary reasons is because it's very expensive to buy options on the market it's ex and they have lots of expensive fees. Why do people push IUL so hard? They get paid a lot for it. The fees are really heavy inside those. And there's no guarantees in most of them. So whole life insurance guarantees that your cash value doesn't go away. You can't lose a penny of it. Once it's in there and credited as cash value, it's guaranteed to be there. You can take that multi-billion dollar company to, to court and win. Um, your premiums can never go up and you can't break the policy by borrowing against it. All three of those things happen in almost every universal life insurance policy. So I would be an idiot standing up here telling you, you should borrow heavily against your policy if I knew that was going to break it and it will break it for IUL. So those are the wow. primary reasons that I will never be somebody who's your financial advisor telling you to use IUL because I don't want to make the phone call and tell you we broke it. So I think that's one of the things I researched a lot because I wanted to set up an IP policy for myself. And when I wanted to withdraw from it, it just wouldn't perform very well. When we, when yeah. we actually yeah. you know, did the illustrations, uh, it didn't perform very well. So that was, but if you are just looking for protection, maybe it's fine, you know, maybe you're not planning to take loans on it. I don't know how it's going to work, but like Gary said, the cost of insurance at, I mean, around 70 and stuff will go up significantly because I've heard a lot of people will say, hey, my UL returns eight or 9%, so whole life is really poor in the returns. And I'm like, okay, it theoretically produces that in the illustration, but I, yeah. you know, tell me it guarantees and produces that every single year of the policy. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, of course it's gonna perform higher than, than whole life because why would anybody buy it any other reason, right? Like this one has all these guarantees. It's been around for 200 years. No one's ever lost any money with it, but this one, it's got the exact same characteristics. None of those guarantees. Why, why don't you get it? Well, obviously you got to illustrate it at a higher level. Why would you not? I mean, no one would take it, right? So you get to play with the lever and say what you want it to, to perform at. And obviously they're going to say it's going to perform higher. It just doesn't. That's the problem. <laughs> Good points. All right. More questions. Uh, does a life insurance like this provide asset protection? Yeah. So again, we're back to what does the state say? In almost every state, does uh, have asset protection from life insurance. And here's the reason why. Because these court cases, when you look into them, um, it says that this is something that has a beneficiary set up. So it's the beneficiary really that's protecting you in a life insurance situation, just like it protects you in an IRA situation in most cases. And that is, hey, this life insurance was set up by me, I'm the owner for the benefit of my wife or for the benefit of my children. Well. You know, in a very unfortunate situation, I harmed somebody. I ran over them with a car or uh, what, um, I don't know, I, I still, a business deal went bad. Some reason I'm getting sued, right? But that was me doing that, not the beneficiary. This money has been set aside for the other person. So the court would actually be, in taking the money, would be hurting the beneficiary who did not harm anyone. And so in almost every case, again, I'm not an attorney nor a CPA, but when I look at those, uh, at those court uh, proceedings and what, what they talk about in the, in the decisions. It's the, it's the beneficiary that's protecting in almost every state. Got it. All right. More questions. I, I, I expected this whole versus IUL or VUL. Uh, so we have a couple more questions. Is there a reference of whole life to IUL or VUL? Is whole life different or is this only whole life insurance or this, can this concept be used with indexed actually i want to take renuka's question about using it with indexed universal life but mm -hmm. i'll let you handle i think we already talked about whole you life did, you did talk about you talked about how it wasn't going to perform too well for yours and then i mentioned that in most universal life insurance policies in all that i've read um, borrowing against the the policy will remove the insurance company from their requirement to, to keep keep premiums level to keep the policy in force um etc so 
that, you know, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of things that can cause the IUL to not have any guarantees. And, and that, listen, the pure purpose of life insurance, I know most of you came not wanting life insurance, you came thinking about cash value, but I, I think a lot of you have families like I do and, and the life insurance is also important. And the idea of insurance, whether it's car insurance, health insurance, or life insurance, is to push the risk to the insurance company. You remember that savings and protection on the bottom layer? It's not just protection of your future income. It's not just life insurance. To have that good foundation, you gotta have car insurance and homeowners insurance and health insurance. And if you're trying to protect your family from getting ejected from the pyramid, it's this really unlikely but really bad thing were to happen, right? You pay off your home for some reason and it burns down. Now you have no savings for retirement right? Because you didn't have insurance on it. Same thing with life insurance, right? So life insurance is like all insurances, let's push the risk to the insurance company. But then with IUL, you get the ability to pull that risk back to yourself. Hey, I want to pay lower premium than the target premium. I just pulled some risk back. I want to borrow against my policy and they said not do it. I'm going to pull some risk back, right? So that, that's kind of the concept there. I want to put my money in a variable universal life and put it actually in the market I'm pulling risk back because what I chose for it to go to may not perform, right? I may lose the money that's funding my family's life insurance. So fundamentally on the insurance side, it's not a good idea. Um, can it be done with universal life? Sure. It can be, you know, frankly, and I'm not trying to be sarcastic. You, you can do this with a, a briefcase, you know, you can put money in the briefcase and you can go um, and, and you can kind of store it there and you can be your own bank there. It just doesn't work very well because it doesn't have all those benefits. You can also do it with a savings account. You can go to a bank and say, I'm going to store $50,000 in a savings account. Then I'm going to come over here and get a secured loan from you guys, borrow your money, let mine sit over there. Again, though, you're earning a half a percent and getting taxed on it. And you're paying them about six or 7% for this loan, right? So it's just that the numbers don't work with other vehicles, but sure, you can, you can pledge a universal life insurance policy as collateral and borrow from the company after you sign the form saying, um, you know, I'm releasing you from all your, uh, all your guarantees. So I just wanted to add to that, um, specifically to Renuka's question on, can it be used with universal, uh, index universal life? So I looked at AIG and Alliance, Alliance uh, illustrations for doing this, and it just wouldn't, for one, it would make out, you know, make is like the when you, know, when you hit the tax limit and you cannot contribute more than a certain amount. So the policy really couldn't de de be designed in a way that I could contribute what I wanted. And second, I really wanted a policy where I could pull out the money or a good portion of the money I put in after three days or three months or whatever. I would take almost seven years in those policies to actually access the capital that I put into it. And because I couldn't put in enough capital, and even if I did put in, it just wouldn't allow me to access that capital for too long. And when I spoke to a couple of, um, this is not to ding IULs, you know, it's all got a place, everything's got a place. Uh, but from a infinite banking standpoint, it just doesn't work very well, right? I talked to an alliance person and I spoke about this and they said, no, we don't recommend taking the money out unless you really want that money, you know, or, or you really need that money. We don't want you to do this to actually pull money out. That was their response. So it just, to answer your question, Ryan, okay, it just doesn't work very well with IULs. Bo asked for us to share that link. So it's down here at the bottom right. If you, I think you can all see this, yes? Yeah. Okay, cool. And then um, Kumaran said, can you take a loan from a 401k and fund the insurance premium? Um, the insurance company, their, their only requirement is that your money is in a US bank account <laughs> and, the, and it's funded from there. Um, so will the 401k allow you to do that? I, I think so. I mean, it really comes down to your 401k manager. Absolutely. And there's some interesting allowances if you, if you meet them for the SECURE Act right now or for the CARES, CARES Act. Act. Yeah. yeah. So with the CARES yeah. Act, you can actually take loans from your 401k and take disbursements without penalties right now. Uh, actually, we did a webinar on this two weeks ago uh, with a CPA. So Hmm. You can actually with yeah. a retirement specialist, so you can actually take money out of your 401k right now and uh, not pay taxes um, until like you have to do 2021, 2022, 2023. Like if you do a disbursement, if you take a loan, you don't owe any taxes. You just pay interest on that loan, which is 2% uh, for the, and you can hold the loan for six years. So hmm. just FYI. All right. Questions, more questions. Um, I think we have 
kind of beat up the IUL versus whole life. Um, but there's another question about why um, whole life premium is higher than IUL. Uh, it's not. It's not necessarily higher. Uh, it, it generally, again, generally, it is. Um, it's portrayed that you can pay a lower uh, premium for universal life insurance because otherwise, the 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 return on investment is not any higher than the whole life, right? So, what's happening with index universal life insurance is that your money's in the same fixed account that it's in at the whole life insurance policy. It's just that they index your dividends or your your kind of profit side to an S and P or some other index out there in, in the market there, it, money's not in the stock market. It's just indexed to it. Well, to, to get it to perform better than whole life insurance, you got to show less money coming out of your pocket, right? That makes the return go higher. Uh, the problem is that it never plays out that way. My father-in-law and many other people are great examples. His, he was getting uh, notices starting at age 64 that his policy will probably make it to 72. They were close. It made it to 71. But at about 66, I entered this industry and he said, hey, what do you think about this? And I mean, it was, it was more than 10 times what he had been paying for 25 years. And when I did the math, uh, it was never going to pull out. It had been underfunded for so many years. It just wasn't going to come out of that. Um, so ho hopefully that helps. Okay, we're not going to talk about IUL versus whole life anymore. We'll go to other Remember, questions. Remember, I got that, I got that email Actually, okay. I will okay. send that out to everyone sure. um, uh, along as, as links they should look at. And Anybody do. wants to dig into that thing. Yeah, yeah. if you want to dig into that, the recordings are there. You can, with, sure. along with the webinar recording, I'm going to send out those links as well. Um, I spend a lot of time doing this too, so I understand. Uh, what is the cost of insurance with these policies? That depends on the age. There's just so many factors to it, right? Right, yeah. So... It is, it is a portion of, again, if you remember the pie piece that we saw, right, it was like less than 1% of all of the savings contributions you're putting into the policy. So it, it absolutely has to do with the age. Maybe what you meant by cost is what's the minimum contribution amount that I can make. Um, that again is age dependent. It's goal dependent as well. I guarantee you that anyone who's on this program can, I can set up something that has a small enough minimum that it works for your life um, and the ability ability to achieve what you want to do for goals. And at the same time, again, you're going to see that it's going to grow far more than your contributions. So what's the cost of the insurance? You know, with whole life insurance, they don't break it out. It's really, really hard to answer that question. But okay. you can make it small enough that it fits. All right. One question from Tinvir. Uh, are you borrowing the amount you put in the policy or can you borrow more than what you paid? Only what, uh, well, it's, it's not necessarily what you paid. It's what's there in cash value. And the amount of cash value is actually going to be lower than what you paid for the first few years up until year five or so normally. And then it's going to be far more than you've contributed as those first couple of years that are held back are, are released back in the cash value. So you can borrow up to 100% of what's in cash value. Again, early, it's a little bit less than what you contributed later, you know, 15 years into the policy to be more than twice what you've contributed. And we can actually walk through the illustrations with you when, you know, you're ready to do a consult. We can talk about how to uh, increase. The, I mean, once you start putting in the cash in terms of paid up additions, you'll actually be able to turn around and access the cash almost immediately. Like most of like what, 90% or more of the cash, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Can you provide some idea of the investment amount or the range of the base policy plus paid up additions? Um, we, we talked about that. I think the range of the base policy depends. We can, we can structure it differently and the paid up additions dependent on how much you want to actually put in. But Gary, I'll let you answer that as well. Yeah. I mean, you could do as little, if you're in, you know, if you're in your forties, you could do as little as like $300 a month, or you could do as much as, um, for the base portion, you could, you could do as much as a hundred thousand dollars a year. Right. So I have, I have clients in their thirties and forties that are putting, you know, 150,000 a year into these. And I have clients who are putting $5,000 a year total into these. Um, so it's, it's a uh, quite expandable, you know, it's, it's just a, it's a scalable product. And so the limitations on how much you can do is going to be based on your income and your age and health. And then how little you can do is basically age. So um, it is true that the base policy premium is higher when you're 80 than it is when you're 20 but it doesn't mean that it costs more. It simply means you're playing at a higher level. If you remember the insurance company is collecting, protecting and growing to get it there at the life expectancy. Well, if you're starting in your twenties, you can collect in really small amounts for a long period of time. 
if you're 70 and your your life expectancy is 85, they're collecting at a higher amount to get it to the number on time. So it still makes sense at 70. It makes sense at 80, actually, if you're healthy. Not that many people are healthy at 80, but it does make sense. Yeah, and then the paid up addition, I actually, I think you have to kind of change your mindset about it being a cost. The paid up addition is actually like you putting savings away, right? So mm -hmm. I think that's something I had to make my, you know, head kind of come around. It's like, I'm like, why would I put $30,000 into a life insurance policy? I don't want my money to be stuck, right? So for me, yeah. that was a time changing, you know, sort of a paradigm shift in a way, because I had to think of it as, oh, would I put $30,000 in my savings? Yes, I would. I mean, it's my savings account. So you can access it. It's still yours, right? So Right, right. And the question there about uh, some of the providers. So Penn Mutual, Mass Mutual, Massachusetts Mutual. New York Life, uh, American United Life, which is also known as One America Corporation, um, The okay. Guardian, uh, let's see, Emeritus, um, Security, uh, Security Mutual, MTL, Mutual Trust Life, I guess is a better way to say that, um, Ohio National, Lafayette, those are the ones that I personally work with, and then there's a few others that we have at Paradigm Life. So the big mutual insurance companies, the old ones. Arun asked, at the outset, the market risk was talked about as a reason to consider this as asset for investment. Aren't you still exposed to the market risk because the insurance company is still going to invest my dollar into the same market? No. So the insurance companies are putting the money to work in the economy like a bank would do. So they are lending out money to large corporations for 30, 40 years at a, at a stretch and getting an income stream from it. Um, they're, they're also... Uh, funding large commercial mortgages, let's say building the One World Trade Center or something, a, a 10, 20 year long, they're looking for very long term commitments from companies. Um, and then they also fund real estate developments. Think like Pulte Homes putting up a 5,000 house subdivision that's going to take 20 years to build, that kind of thing. Yeah, so not exposed to the markets, completely not correlated to ups and downs of the, of the stock market. All right, Richard asks, is there only one initial medical exam or periodic future exams? And are there pre-existing conditions allowed or does that require lower rated qualifying standards and higher premium? Yeah, we should talk specific about your situation. Um, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, it's possible to not even have a medical exam as we go through this. Um, and, and so, but if there is, there's only one and you get guaranteed insurability for the rest of your life with that policy. Um, yeah, so I, I think we answered that. But as far as like pre-existing, um, it's possible to do pre-existing. In most cases, mutual insurance companies don't do that pre-existing unless it's like, uh, like I have some military combat pilots, then you can get a waiver or an exclusion, excuse me an exclusion for if you die in the cockpit of an airplane, you're not, you know, you're not covered. But generally, they're not going to do that for health situations in most cases. Um, generally, their situation is once you're, once you're insured, you are, everything is covered. So Gary, if let's say I have diabetes or I have an existing heart issue, so does that mean I'm not covered or I'm just covered at a different rating level? Yeah, it so would be a different rating. Right. Um, I can't guarantee they'll say yes to it. If you have, you know, really high A1C, for example, um, or, you know, cancer that's, you know, only been, only been in remission a year, those are probably not insurable. Um, but if you have, you know, I have a, a type one diabetic who's had it for years and has an A1C that's below seven and he's got a table two rating. So um, that's a great rating. It'll do just fine. Um, on performance for cash value. So you can still set it up. It just means that you'll have a different rating, right? Mm -hmm. And performance will be a little bit different. But the thing is, performance is really based on um, the, the, excuse me, when you get a lower rating, that has a big impact on like term insurance. It has a big impact on, on when you have a large death benefit, but we're minimizing the death benefit. And so when you get a, a lower rating, when you look at the cash value performance, it's really substantial. You know, it's, it's not a big difference. It's surprising. Right. So Arun asked, is it possible to set up the death benefit to grow until a certain family member, to continue to grow until a certain family member, like the youngest grandchild reaches a certain age? Um, 
So I think, um, so remember life insurance is tied to a human life and the insured individual. And so you could certainly put life insurance on the child if that maybe is what we're talking about. And you could, and you could uh, make contributions to it or have it grow until the child gets to be 21 years old or something like that. And then you could turn it over to that child or you could surrender it if you wanted to, but I wouldn't recommend it. But, you know, so we can do things like that at life on, the, on that individual, on that child. If we were talking more about uh, can we set it up on you, for something having something to do with them? Well, I mean, the payout doesn't occur until that individual, whoever the insured person is, passes away. What happens a lot with trusts is that we will buy, like generation one, will buy life insurance on the grandchildren. And when the grandchild gets to be 20 or 21, now there's this 20 year long funded, wonderful seasoned life insurance policy that they can turn over to them or they can use to buy their first home, start their, you know, get their first job, that kind of thing. I hope I'm not that sure I'm... I answered that, but that was my best effort. Yeah, if you have any other questions, please feel free to set up a consult and we are happy to talk through it. Uh, Ramesh asks, how does cash value work if you have a loan against it for your beneficiary? I'm not sure I understand for your beneficiary aspect of it. Uh, how does it work for the beneficiary if you have a loan against it, I think? So it, when, you, when you pass away, if you have a loan against the cash value, then that portion that is pledged as collateral will, will be removed from the death benefit. They pay off that loan prior to uh, paying the death benefit out to the, out to the beneficiary. So it'd be dollar for dollar impact. So question is, if you withdraw cash value, does that amount get reduced from the death benefit? It does. Yeah. If you're physically withdrawing, um, it is actually, um, it'll have a disproportionate impact on the death benefit. It depends on what year you draw it out. But if you're in your seventies and eighties, it's pretty close to dollar for dollar. Um, you physically take out 20,000 it'll be a 20,000 reduction in death benefit. If you borrow, then it goes back to that previous question. It's dollar for dollar because they will settle that up at the end. So yeah, you can actually structure it in such a way that you can actually do it like withdrawals for retirement mm -hmm. from your cash mm -hmm. value up to the amount that you actually contributed to the policy. It's like a tax free withdrawal because it already came from post tax dollars, right? So you can actually set it up that way. And that's kind of how I'm doing it for my policy. That's kind of how I want to do it. I do want to reduce the death benefit and I want to take advantage of the cash value and use it for my retirement. So yes. All right. Satish asks, what are the fees and deductions for first year on whole life insurance? Yeah. So it's a percentage of the base portion. If you remember that minimum portion, that life insurance, insurance companies holding back that base portion for the first two years and they are growing it just like they're growing the other money and they're giving you the profits from the other money and they are holding back and taking the profits from those first two years of base minimum contribution. They're using that to cover their startup costs. I know that was not um, that it was not a dollar amount and I can't give you a dollar amount because it's proportional to the policy. It's impacted by your age, gender, health, size of life insurance policy. I can't give you an exact dollar amount. I can show you the impact of it when you look at an actual illustration. Okay, a lot more questions. I... It's awesome. It's inspiring, yeah? <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, so I, I want to answer this one because I, I think it's an interesting question. If either of you have always, are either of you always been a whole life advocate? If not what was the aha moment that made you convert oh uh, we both get to answer this one i think yes i, I want to go. go so ahead. what happened last year was i always thought whole life is like you know how um uh, what's his name dave ramsey says you know invest term i mean invest in term and pay the difference or whatever i don't know he has some term i term there. and invest the difference yeah. i come and invest the difference i always thought that way because i'm like whole life four percent like why would i want my money to sit up four percent and i'm not thinking compounding right i'm not thinking of the power of compounding i'm not thinking dividends I didn't know I had access to the cash in it. It was just so many factors contributing to the decision. But my aha moment was reading this book called Money, Wealth, and Life Insurance. Uh, I will also send a link to that in my, rec in my um, webinar uh, recording. I was like, oh, you know, like my jaw dropped when I read that. I was like, oh, this is how, it's called how the rich supercharge their sa savings account or savings and create like generational wealth. So for me, that was definitely the aha moment. Reading that book really changed my perspective of life insurance. So I wasn't always a whole life uh, uh, advocate. So remember my story about the, the old life insurance salesman. He always came into our house with a cigar and uh, my parents were always 
fearful when he would show up because they'd have to write another check. And so I just, I just had this image of life insurance guys. And then I was at the Naval Academy one year and I, and I was reading, I was a junior, I think, and I, and I was reading Susie Orman's book. I was always fascinated about personal finance. And she convinced me that whole life and sale, like what I remembered about childhood was absolutely right. This life insurance guy was a crook. And so my mother had gotten a policy on me when I was a baby. And um, I told, called her and told her how she'd been taken her entire life. And she says, Gary, you can have your policy and you can cash it in if you think that's the right answer, but I'm holding on to mine. Um, and the reason she said that is because my father had passed in his early 60s after you know, the health expenses of that, of that farm uh, about a year earlier. And it had transformed her life uh, to, she had a, a new car for the first time in her life. She had money that she could live on. I mean, it, it was just, it was tremendous. Um, and she was holding on to hers and hers paid all of her expenses and, uh, everything as well. And, um, and so I sold mine and then two years later or three years later, get married and we buy whole life insurance because I do the math and I realize ah, I, I should have kept that thing. It was a pretty solid policy. <laughs> Um, but I did the math and I realized the term insurance was not for me because I did want my family to have something when I died. And I'm going to die of a very old age and term insurance and universal can't do the job. Um, and so I became a whole life per, uh, an investor, a whole life insurance family for about 10 years before I started doing this as an advisor, maybe, maybe 20 years before. Great question. You'll keep answering questions since they're here. We'll just get through all of them because they're, they're just right. coming. Um, all right, let's see. What is a good use case for fixed IUL? I don't know if I can answer that. Thought we weren't going to talk about that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so what is a good use case for a fixed um, young individual who's going to get rid of it, uh, does not want to die with life insurance in place, and for some reason... Um, uh, wants to get exposure. Well, indexed universal life is not exposed to the market. Um, I, I, I'd say, um, I thought I kind of want this, this kind of hybrid investment and life insurance thing. And it just right. doesn't make any sense. I mean, lower payments, lower payments, you, you know, can make them lower, like but they won't survive. Either. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, but you just got to know I'm getting rid of this thing in the future because it won't survive. Right. So that, uh, that brings up to another question. If I have an IUL, how can I save it from collapsing? Well, there's a beautiful thing like, like in the real estate world, uh, in the real estate world, there's a thing called 1031 tax deferred exchange. And you can take the cash that you have and you can take the basis, which is the, the, the ledger statement of how many, how many contributions you've made. You can take both those really important things and you can move it into, transfer it over into a whole life insurance policy, tax-free. It's just an exchange, just like a 1031 is with real estate. It's called 1035 exchange. And then when you get out there and you want to start taking distributions, you get to take credit for all the contributions you made for the universal life insurance policy, as well as what you've done for the whole life. And any cash that did actually move over now is growing in a guaranteed 100% protected environment going forward. I do that all the time. I don't replace whole life insurance policies, not very often, uh, but I replace every universal life insurance really that I come across. Not every, but most. Okay. Great question. Do mortgage companies have issues when borrowing from whole life for a down payment? That's a good question. No. Uh, well, it's possible um, if they are unfamiliar with it because the industry, the mortgage industry got beaten up after 2008 with regulation changes saying that you cannot borrow a down payment. They really, if you've, if you've borrowed for real estate, you know that, that uh, they, they go through any deposit into your account with a fine tooth comb. Where'd this money come from? Where'd that money come from? So, three so what I, before. <laughs> yeah, so what I do, uh, what, what I do all the time is I help my clients. Um, I show them, I mean, I, if you want me to, I'll work directly with the lender. Um, and I'll send them a before and after statement about your policy showing where the loan came from. And often there's, they'll also want a letter from the insurance company saying that you don't have to pay this loan back. Cause what they're really worried about is that you borrowed money and you're going to pay that other down payment lender and not pay them the bank. So they want to make sure that you're not like, you know, you don't have money flowing in multiple directions. And so just knowing that you don't have to pay back the loan is enough for them. They're happy. 
But I'm I'll typing out questions. some of the answers just to get through them because I could answer them. So just re reduce the number of questions. And I know it's been way over our time. It's been almost two hours. So thank you, Gary, for hanging in There's here. There's 37 people on this thing still. I know people have <laughs> dropped off, but there's still 37 yeah, people left. Nice. I'm surprised. Um, all right. Does it make sense financially to have life insurance if you're a single person with no kids? That's a good question. Sure. Um, so again, we're doing this for the cash value performance. What I would ask is, does it make sense to store your money in a location where it's going to grow with an internal rate of return of 5.37% where I would have to do 8% in a savings account or 10% in a brokerage account? If my emergency savings and opportunity fund storage safe tank can do better than the life insurance, then use the other one. Otherwise, use the life insurance and say, well, it'll be there in case I get married someday. Or I'm guessing that all of us in our lives, as we get near the end of life and we're thinking about this wonderful journey we've been on, there's going to be somebody we care about and we love and we'd love to leave something for them. So I think everyone would have a purpose for life insurance if it was in place. But remember, it's funded in the background and that's taken into account before you see that performance. Expedited yeah. death benefits, absolutely. So that's called accelerated death benefits for chronic illnesses or um, terminal illnesses that comes with every one of the companies that we work with. It's a no cost addition. Most companies are doing that now, but you can accelerate it and can, if you have those conditions show up in your life, you know, within the last few years of, of your time and you'll be able to get access to a large portion of the death benefit. So it's like um, you have a heart attack or you have cancer or whatever, you can get access to Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Is there, a, uh, this is the last question, if there's not another one here. Uh, is there a max limit to the lump sum amount you can, you, you can put into the whole life policy? First premium. Yeah, there is. And um, it depends on the company on how much you can manipulate the IRS regulation. So there's a, there's a limit from the IRS and it would allow you to, and that's not a dollar amount maximum. It's a percentage of all the cash going in. So for example, my first policy, I had a 10,000 minimum. Um, and most years, except year one, I had a 40,000 maximum. So I could do anywhere between 10 and 40 in a given year. Um, the first year, the, the company I went with, I could do anywhere between 10 and 110. So it, it was 100,000 of the extra cash stuck on top of that base. Um, harder to do today in 2020, but it's possible to have extra in year one. And the, and the limit on what that dollar amount looks like is based on kind of your income, net worth, um, age, things like that. But yeah, you can, there is a max and it depends on your, your specific situation. All right, last question. We are wrapping up after this. Uh, can the rate of return four or five percent for whole life change during the lifetime? It can. Yeah, we're at we're at the lowest that we've recorded with life insurance companies dating back into 1800s, and um, the reason is because we've been in this zero interest rate world. So the insurance companies are like banks, right? They are they're out there trying to earn a yield and in an economy where money is very very inexpensive. Now they also, our dividend also, it's not just from these loans. It also comes from any term insurance they have. We get those profits, uh, retirement accounts, long-term care, disability, things that are other than just the whole life insurance money at work. We get profits from all that as owners of whole life policies. Um, so it helps, but we are at about the lowest that we've ever seen. It, in the eighties, for example, it was more like 12%, not four to 5%. So you're really seeing a conservative number now um, it does move up and down based on performance of lending out in the economy. So Gary, let's say last year I set up my policy and I had a 4% guaranteed return. Will that mean my policy return will keep changing every year or is just a 4% mm -hmm. throughout the life of the policy? No, it would go, oh, the guarantee doesn't change, but doesn't. The, the dividends will go up and down adding on top of the guarantee. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to clarify that the guaranteed never changes. You're always getting that. It's only the dividends that change from year to year. Correct. Uh, Correct. Kumar had a last question. I know I keep saying last, but how soon after paying premium? I think this is important. How soon after paying your premiums can you borrow from the cash value or a percentage of it? So I did it in three days. It was very painful for our team. I would recommend no, no less than a week. Um, you know, it's possible. Uh, but 
it's very quick is really the right answer. You probably weren't expecting, you know, we're not going to argue about three or seven days, but it's, it's very quick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we are going to wrap this up. We lost about half the people. <laughs> <laughs> but probably thank East you. Coasters like me. They're with all the Bostonians. <laughs> thank you for the other half that actually stayed through the whole presentation for two hours. <laughs> this has been <laughs> the longest. I'm sorry that the audio got us at the beginning there. Yeah, no, that, this has been the longest webinar I've ever had. That's a, that's a record. <laughs> I always like going for records. <laughs> uh, this was really good. I, I feel like every time I revisit this, I learn more. And there's so, so much to learn about in different ways people use it. So thank you, Gary, again, for being here and talking to our audience about this. Uh, I think this is something we all need to learn about. And I wish somebody had just told me sooner because the cost of insurance would be much lower. <laughs> you know, that's what my 80 year olds say about when they were 60. And I laughed I because I the 60 year old they are before said it. <laughs> Great. Well, I appreciate this. Thank you everyone for joining in. I'm really excited to have you all here and uh, thanks for hanging in here. Hopefully we got through all of your questions. If you have any other questions or you wanna set up a consult, please visit that link and sign up there and we will get through all of the names and we'll, we'll set up uh, consults for one-on-one one -on -one with you so we can actually address your specific situation. Um, again, thank you again for time. taking so much time away from your families on a Sunday evening to come learn with us. I always appreciate it and I always love when people do this and they're working to change their lives and learn all the time. So I really appreciate that. Um, that's it for tonight. Uh, two hours later. Thank you much. <laughs> thank you. Bye -bye. Guys.